glory demands our humble, our complete, our serious devotion. So let's be careful not to merely use God as a pawn shop and instead focus on Christ who will indeed trade in our bad days for his, his grace. Let's gaze reliantly towards Christ who will overtake Heavenly Father, right now we just ask that you might prepare our hearts to come into your presence, Father. We just thank you that you allow us to come and, and just worship in our giving, Father, in our praise and our worship, and in, in that opportunity to open your word and make imp uh, application of that word in our lives. Father, we thank you that you pray, place friends in our lives, those in our lives that, that Father, when we do it big just it's it's the progression the progression doesn't change do it at the verse where we do it big all right if the kids can come on forward for the children's message and everybody else just have a seat Where did all y'all come from? You're not usually up this early and at the first service. I got a test for you. Does anybody know what that is? It's a radio. A radio? What makes you think it's a radio? You never, you didn't know it was a radio. You, it doesn't look like a radio that you would have, does it? But you're right. It's a radio. It's called a transistor radio, and I, I grew up going fishing with my dad in an old aluminum boat and every time we went fishing dad would pull this transistor radio out and it just gets AM stations and he'd put it on the back of the boat back where he sat and he would turn on uh, WBAP radio anybody heard of WBAP 820 in Dallas Fort Worth yeah some yeah you have you're way too young this is twice as old as you are uh, WBAP with Hal J and Dick Siegel they were the disc jockeys and they were hilarious and I listened to them for hours and hours on end I didn't even like country music but I learned to after that and I pulled this out of my uh, save from dad box and I just wanted to see if it worked I pulled out an ancient battery and I turned it on and it works look at that we don't know whether Titus made it to Nicopolis see it's a sermon I don't know literally Church, I turned it on this morning and, and the guy was preaching about shepherd and sheep. 
Uh, it really was cool. Uh, he said something crazy, so I turned him off. But uh, anyway. <laughs> You know why I showed you this is that when I see this radio, you know what I think about? I think about my dad. I think about spending time with my dad. I spent, I probably caught hundreds and hundreds of fish while I was fishing with my dad. And some were big, but I don't think of those things when I think, look at this radio. I think of my dad. And he took it with us dove hunting. We took it with us uh, when his radio went out in his station wagon and we would go to Nebraska. This would go on the dashboard. This radio reminds me of time with him. And I started thinking about something that I would want you to know about your heavenly father is that one of the things that he wants you to know about him is that he loves to spend time with you and that's why this reminds me of my dad because we spent a lot of time together and this radio reminds me of that and I want you to know that your heavenly father loves spending time with you you don't have to be at Awana we love for you to come and teach you God's word or Sunday school or worship service we want you to come to those things but I want you to know that you can go and be on the playground in your backyard and in your room anywhere and your heavenly father loves just to be with you so here's something I did about your age even about probably closer to Jared's age than some of the younger ones but I want you to still do this I want you to find a quiet place in your yard and I just want you to ask mom and dad say can I go sit there and just think and just think the fact that your heavenly father God is right there with you and he loves being with you and you can just talk to him and he will listen better than anybody in the world. And he cares about you. Now, you won't hear him talk back, but I want you to remind yourself that he loves spending time with you. And then you find something that reminds you of that. I just, I just had a great time with my dad, a lot, a lot of hours with him. But I've learned that I have an even better time with my Heavenly Father. And I spend time with him now even when I'm not at church. Lots of time. And I want you to learn to do the same thing, that he enjoys you. He made you just like you are. Did you know that? He picked the color of hair and the color of eyes and how tall you're going to be and, and what you're going to do for a career and all of that. He made you that special because he loves you. And I just want you to know he enjoys you no matter what you're doing, okay? So let's pray together and try to remind ourselves of that. Father, you said in 1 John 1, 3 that uh, through that uh, aged apostle that he invites us into fellowship with you. And fellowship means being with you and enjoying your presence. And I pray that these kiddos would learn that you enjoy their presence. They don't have to perform. They don't have to do anything. You love them. And you want them to sit at your feet and just enjoy your presence. Like I got to do with my dad in that boat so many hours. Thank you, Father, for that example. It reminds me of how much you enjoy my company. And I love that about you, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, guys. As the children find their seat, um, please stand with us and let's just sing about, celebrate the joy that we can have, um, the freedom of joy in that we're not under the authority of sorrow or suffering. I'm trading my sorrows and I'm trading my shame. I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. I'm trading my sickness. I'm trading my pain. I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Amen. I rest but not crushed, persecuted, not abandoned. Struck down but not destroyed. I'm blessed beyond the curse, for His promise will endure. His joy is going to be my strength. Though the sorrow may last through the night, his joy comes with the morning. I'm trading my sorrows, and I'm trading my shame, and I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. I'm trading my sickness, and I'm trading my pain. 
the joy of the Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Amen. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Amen. Choose to say yes to him right now. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Amen. 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 Isn't it wonderfully comforting knowing that um, God will always protect us and he'll always take on those burdens. We can trade them in. Um, he wants us to experience his joy, but Casey's been preaching about how um, in Psalm 23 we're taught that our Christian life won't be without struggle. It won't be without um, grief or trouble or pain. And we need to remember that we can trade those things in. They will happen, but we can give them to God because of his presence and his power. Um, even if this doesn't always make sense when the pain is, is really great, really, really big, or if the, if the situation is really, really confusing, um, we have to remember that God will shoulder those burdens. This next um, song that we're going to do is a really old hymn, and uh, it really focuses on taking time and, and taking focus, um, our focus into God's presence and being still there and being comforted there. And um, let's be careful not to tra treat God like um, a pawn shop. Let's take time to really, really give our, um, our humble devotion, our complete devotion to Christ who will shoulder all those burdens. Be still, my soul, the Lord is on your side. Bear patiently the cross of grief or pain. Leave to your God to order and provide in every change.
trust you God whatever comes my way I will trust you God whatever comes my way I will trust you your holy name. We thank you for everything that you give to us. Just this chance to be with you. Let you come down and show yourself anew to us. We thank you, Jesus, and it's in your son's holy name that we pray. Amen. You guys can be seated. Uh, this song special is, is a new praise song. It's uh, maybe 15 or 20 years old and just was not um, in the mainstream when it was popular and uh, there's some great lyrics here it's upbeat and fun but it also has a lot of words um, that uh, are really pretty and um, it connects directly to Psalm 23 you'll see that in the second verse uh, so enjoy this with us worship with us as we present this to you Left a seamless robe behind Woke up in a stable crying Lived and died and rose again Savior for a guilty land Story like a children's tune It's grown familiar as the moon So now I ride my camel high I'm aiming for the needle's eye And I chase the wind, but I chased in vain I chased the earth, but it would not sustain There's only one who never fails to back in the morning light There's only one who sets loose the gales and ties the trees down tight When all around my soul gives way he is all my hope and stay. There's only one, only one, holy one. Lord, you are my prince of peace. But this war brings me to my knees. See, there's a table you prepared. And all my enemies are there But where my shepherd leads, where else can I go? Who else fills my cup till it overflows? There's only one who never fails The back in the morning line There's only one who sets loose the gales And ties the trees down tight And to the solid rock I fly Though he bids me come and die, there's only one, only one, holy one. There's only one who never fails to back in the morning line. There's only one who sets loose the gales and ties the trees down tight. When all around my soul gives way, he is all my hope and stay. There's only one, only one. There's only one who never fails to back in the morning light. There's only one. trees down tight and to the solid rock I fly though he bids me come and die there's only one only one holy one
Guys, y'all, uh, come here, all of you. Mm. Come gather around here. Give me your hands. No, just give me your hands. We're going to pray and thank God for his, his power in that. God, I thank you for these men and women who have uh, led us to the very throne of worship today. You've anointed them. You've called them together and used them greatly. Thank you for how they've refreshed my soul and spirit in song. And God, I pray that you would um, allow your word to be powerful in our midst right now. And thank you for the stage being set, for your word to be proclaimed so adequately. In Jesus' great name, amen. Thank you, guys. appreciate you. Mm. I have uh, oftentimes wrestled with things that are said in the Bible. I didn't used to because I didn't used to feel a freedom to do that, but I do now. Uh, things that don't appear to make sense, things that bother me or trouble me, uh, things that sometimes conflict or those questions that you get in the back of your mind that you wish you had the answer to, but you're kind of afraid to ever ask it certainly out loud. Have you ever had those questions? You, you read that and you go, man, I know God's word's true, but that doesn't make sense. Something doesn't click there. I've got one for you. And you're all going to, maybe not all, but many of you are going to know this verse. And you're going to be like me where you've read it a thousand times, but you just never stopped and let it stagger you or even confound you. And Jesus said, he said, I've told you these things. He said this in John 16. I told you these things that you may have peace, that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. Now just stop and listen to what Jesus said. I've told you all of these things so that in me you may have peace. The next words out of his mouth are, in this world you will have trouble. Now, see, we can get all churchy right there and go, well, of course, we know the theological answer. But in my heart and in my mind, that is a confounding, conflicting statement. You're going to have trouble, but you're going to have peace because the way I function in my natural self is that I need peace to be peaceful. I need circumstances to be good and lined up and life going fairly well and then I can be peaceful. That's how I function in my humanity. But Jesus turns that on his heads and he even finishes that verse and said, but take heart, I've overcome the world. We love to quote that verse, but we very seldom stop and think about the massive conflict that he's presenting on purpose. Jesus never tries to make it easy. He always tries to make it significant. He's promising that we're going to experience trouble. And then he indicates that we can have peace. And he seems to be saying that we shouldn't be worried about the emotional shipwrecks. We shouldn't be worried about the devastation and the debilitating pain, physical or emotional, that are guaranteed parts of our future. 1 Thessalonians 5.16, Paul said, he said, rejoice always, not sometimes not when life is easy, not when the money's coming in or when the health problems are absent. He says, rejoice always. And again, he says in Philippians, rejoice again, I say, rejoice always. Seems to be this unconditional, massive statement of abiding joy and peace regardless of circumstances. But how can you have peace when you're dealing with chronic pain? How do you have peace when, when a child dies? How do you... How can you have peace when you lose a job and can't find another one for months after months after months? How can you have peace when you have a devastated family relationship? How can you have peace when nothing around you is peaceful or looks even remotely good? How can you do that? I, I, all right, push pause. I want to invite you to be bold enough today this morning, right now, not to just to stick a theological band-aid on the problem I'm presenting. Because we all know, many of us know the theological answer. Jesus gave us the answer, but I want us to wrestle with it from the perspective that we so often wrestle with it from, this, the human side of things. And I don't want us to wallow, I'm not asking you to do that, but I think we need to feel the conflict for a minute. I think we need to look at the scenario from from a, a pretty human perspective for a minute so that we can relish the answer in a lot richer and, and, and more significant way. Just take a minute to stand in the shoes of someone facing a terminal illness. 
Take a minute to stand in the shoes of someone who's, whose child is rebelling in a catastrophic way or someone who just got handed divorce papers or is drowning in addiction to alcohol. How can we possibly walk up to a family member today in Boston, Massachusetts, as someone who lost a loved one there and say to rejoice always? It almost sounds cruel, in fact. I want you to, to know something about me right now. I'm utterly and deeply convinced that the Word of God is infallible. I wasn't always, but I, I stand before you today convinced that God's Word is perfect and that when there is an apparent contradiction, I know that the problem lies in my perspective and not in God's wisdom. I know that, but I'm also comfortable enough in that to wrestle with the problems that are presented because I know that there's an answer. So I don't just brush past them and say, well, God's word's God's word, and, and it's all true. I, I get in the middle of this stuff and say, but Jesus, I know I'm supposed to have peace, but look at the circumstances. And, and instead of hearing the Father say back to me, Casey, you know better, you know the answer, so get with it, I hear him invite me into the conflict again and walk with me through it once again to reassure me of his presence and his power and his victory over the world and all of that and learning to be peaceful to learn to be like Jesus is a systematic process of it's a layering process of, of walking and learning and walking and learning and walking and learning it's not an event so I'm gonna ask you a question that I think is very very important it's very very important that you ask it not that I ask it of you, but that you ask it of yourself. And the question is, do you believe, do you believe that it's possible to find peace and enjoy fellowship with Jesus when the circumstances of your life are anything but enjoyable? Do you believe that? Or do you just put a theological band-aid that is you take the Bible answer and stamp it over your true emotional state and then irregardless of how you feel this is what you present even though it's not the authentic reality of your life I know I'm supposed to rejoice so I'm rejoicing but inside you think my life is a catastrophe that's what we've got to stop because your life will remain a catastrophe on the inside if we just stick a theological band-aid on the wounds that Jesus invites us to walk with him through I want you to read Psalm 23 with me. Just follow along in your scripture. We're going to read just the first part of verse 5. Would you stand in the great honor of reading God's word together? King David writing says one simple and profound statement. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You Shepherd Jesus, prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Let's pray. God, that is your word. And even as I say it out loud again, I'm struck with how hard it is to incorporate, to take in that statement as truth. I, God, want my enemies to be vanquished. I want them to be gone. I want the problems, the adversaries, the pain erased. But you invite me to a table of fellowship in the presence of those very things. And maybe, Father, what I'm learning today, it is the presence of adversity that makes the fellowship with you so rich. In Jesus' name, amen. We're walking through Psalm 23, maybe more systematically than you would like. And if you're one who likes diversity and get on to the next thing, then I apologize, but this is too rich to pass over. I, uh, Psalm 23 and verse 5 is two distinct statements, and they can't really be brought together. Initially, when I did the outline, these were all, this was all one, but, but if you look at what David is saying in this part of the psalm, and you realize these, these are thoughts that are enough for us to dwell on together for a morning. The, the shepherd and the sheep. Let's do this analogy again. The, the picture of the sheep uh, here is, the picture of the sheep and the shepherd relationship is, is, again, as we introduced last week, there were transitions 
from winter to summer ranges and that is the picture that is here and they're ascending the mountaintop from the winter uh, valleys below and they're ascending up through the valleys and the cuts that go up the side of the mountain to the to the alpine meadows above timberline where most shepherds would keep their flocks throughout the summer that's the view that David is taking here those alpine meadows are still in his mind's eye and the word David used is he says you prepare a table before me the word for table the word for table is often used to describe a flat tabletop pasture where the shepherd would lead his sheep for their summer that was a very common word in shepherding uh, profession that they would take them to those tabletops those, those places are still referred to as mesas the Spanish word for table it means flat table like and uh, these, these, those mesas as the shepherd would lead the flock towards them towards that summer range he would make some short excursions remember last week we said they would go up through the valley of the shadow of death that dark valley of timber and darkness but it was lush and it was well supplied with water but it was filled with danger as well as they would lead that was not a day journey okay that was a trek so the shepherd would find a place and and of uh, keeping for his sheep and, and as they made their way up that journey he would take a short excursions away from his sheep to go to the mesa or the tabletop to prepare it for the sheep knowing in advance that's where they would spend their time knowing in advance that's the destination knowing in advance that's the place that he needed to invest the most time where they were in the journey was all temporary it didn't need preparation they dealt with what was there but he would leave often leave and go and go to the mesa or the tabletop and he would prepare it well for the flock's arrival so here's some things that a shepherd would do up there so what would he do I mean he didn't have farm implements he didn't have an ATV to get up and down he couldn't haul a lot well one of the things that one of the several things that he would do but one that was very important is there were certain weeds and I'm not going to go over the names of them but there were there were specific weeds that were noxious uh, in uh, species of plants that that needed to be eradicated before the sheep arrived and specifically some of those plants would if a, if a lamb or a young sheep ate one of them it could almost kill it and certainly would cause the shepherd a lot of extra work as he nursed multiple sheep back to health so he'd pull those weeds uh, he would clear pools of water of debris and danger oftentimes they would return but they uh, would often dig out pools so that there would be water and then he would go up in, in advance and get all you know in the fall and you can imagine all the stuff that would settle in the pool same thing as happens in a swim pool if you don't cover it up get all the debris out so that it would fill up with clean clear water uh, get the water supplies ready he would bring a supply often of salt and minerals for the summer and and journey up there and take those up there and lead them in advance or he would uh, especially note any potential danger spots and prepare accordingly one of the most important things they would do is to take note of potential ambush spots where predators would lurk in these meadows that would be uh, up above timberline there were also still brushy areas and draws that would be the most likely spots for a predator to ambush the flock so a shepherd would go and take note of those spots and especially prepare in his mind how he would avoid those to be very very capable in keeping his she sheep away from the predators note that he didn't go up there on an ex on, on something to uh, eradicate all of the predators he can go up there and try to get rid of the predators he went and prepared the place for fellowship quote unquote for the shepherd and the sheep in the spite of the fact that there were still going to be predators there he could not couldn't eradicate them couldn't get rid of them but he could take note of how to take care of his sheep in the presence of those so the most dangerous thing a sheep would face were going to face were predators often those meadows those those, those places would be f filled uh, with with potential danger it says predators are uh, intuitive they follow food supplies I uh, just heard another story this morning of coyotes feeding on domestic animals happens all the time they uh, adjust their food supply so too would the would the wolves and the bears and the mountain lions know that in the summer there would be sheep abundant up there so they would migrate they would know there would be an abundance it would attract predators so the shepherd would be so prepared 
as the sheep arrived that the sheep could totally relax even though the predators were no doubt going to be nearby. It was impossible to escape their presence. It was impossible to eradicate them. They were going to be there. But the sheep could not go to these alpine meadows and spend the summer in constant terror. They couldn't know that the, they couldn't be there and relax. As you, we talked about, sheep would be very, very anxious. And if they, didn't, if they couldn't settle down, they wouldn't eat. If they wouldn't eat, they wouldn't be healthy. And, the, and ultimately, the flock would be devastated, even from fear of potential danger. So something had to be done. So the shepherd would make excursions, and he would prepare the tabletop. He would prepare those meadows, not only eradicating weeds, not only preparing the water sources, but taking note, where are the potential danger spots? Where can the sheep relax? How can I keep them from harm? The picture is really clear. I think the analogy is hard to get. Jesus, our good shepherd, goes before us. And certainly, I know that ultimately that's a true statement, right? Jesus said, I go before you to prepare a table um, I pre to prepare a place for you that where I am you may one day be also so obviously our shepherd has, has journeyed into the heavens and is preparing our eternal destiny and that is a great comfort to me that is a great promise that we should hold on to but we also need to know that our great shepherd Jesus is going ahead of us in life that he is making short excursions ahead of us he is making preparatory advances in in help and in, in hopes, not in hopes, but in, in the effort to make sure that our destination, where we are going to, is well prepared. One of the neat things about this verse is the concept, just the mental picture of a table, of fellowship, which represents, when you talk about table, the, the, op, the spiritual parallel is, a, is that the table was a time for fellowship. When somebody sits down at your table, and they share a meal with you. It is about connecting. It's about relationship. It's about fellowship. And so too is it in this song. See, he, our Jesus, our shepherd, Jesus, does his job in the presence of the enemy, not in the absence. And if the shepherd is present, it doesn't matter if the, present, if the enemy's present or not. If Jesus is present... It doesn't matter if the, if the difficulty, if the pain, if the problem, if the enemy is there or not. He is so complete in his ability to care for the flock. For you and I, we can rest well and enjoy the presence. Enjoy the presence. Not just be aware of the presence, but enjoy the presence of the shepherd in the presence of the enemy. What an incredible statement that is. We can enjoy fellowship with Jesus while our problems, while our adversity, while our pain, while our enemies surround us, while they encamp around us, we can still find radical peace, authentic fellowship with Jesus, connection with Him, even when the problems persist, because Jesus is all we need for peace to invade our lives. Well, that is such an oversimplified statement when I say it out loud. I know that sounds preachery, but I want that to sink in just for a minute. Jesus, Jesus is all we need for peace to invade our lives. And that's not necessarily an instant reality that happens the moment that you get saved. If I were to, to tell you that if you came and accept Jesus today and, and, then, and then no matter what happened, you were going to have peace, I would be lying to you because this, this knowing of peace amidst adversity is a spiritual journey that and a process that takes place I am better able today at the age of 43 to enjoy the peaceful presence and fellowship of Jesus in spite of adversity than I was at 23 it's been a process and I've been through many things in those few years of my life and short compared to some and not as many adversities as compared to some in this room but in those 20 some years in the loss of uh, people I've loved and the adversity and the conflict of leading churches I've found that peace can come in the presence of the enemy because of the presence of the shepherd and as our shepherd Jesus prepares the mountaintops for us mountaintop experiences are something we almost uh, make light of today we almost talk 
as if we can't, you know, we say things, we can't stay on the mountaintop. Those pinnacles of spiritual reality and those times where God just explodes with good things in your world, those mountaintop experiences, Jesus wants those for us. We need those times. We can't camp there. It's much like when when Jesus took his disciples up and we call it the Mount of Transfiguration when he was... He was transfigured into a radiance of heavenly glory and Moses and Elijah appear and and Peter witnesses all this and he's like, God, we can just stay. Jesus, can we just stay here? We just want to stay on this mountaintop. This was so amazing. What I just witnessed was so powerful. Can we just stay here on this mountaintop? And of course, Jesus didn't let them. They had to descend. Moses couldn't stay on the mountaintop when he got the... Ten Commandments, he had to descend into the valley where there was all manner of humanity going awry. And neither do we get to stay on the mountaintop. But man, we need to enjoy those moments. But we also need to know that mountaintops are not simply times when adversity is absent. The longer you and I live, the more we realize that there is almost never going to be a season in your life when problems or pain or difficulty or the enemy is not present. There are times when it's minimal, and we enjoy those times. But if we think that we can walk through life orchestrating the circumstances of our life so that we can have a minimum amount of pain or difficulty or problems so that we can minimize the presence of the enemy so that we can maximize our enjoyment of Jesus, then we are going to have a futile effort and a wrong effort. Because what we need to do is reset the button and say, no, 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 no. Peace and joy and fellowship comes because Jesus advances the cause. He is ahead of me preparing those rich times of fellowship. He knows the enemy well. He knows the adversity. He knows the problems. You're you're not going to have a difficulty that sneaks up on Jesus. There's not going to be a potential enemy lurking in the bushes of your life waiting to ambush you that Jesus, your shepherd, is not aware of. He's not going to set up camp in a place where you are vulnerable to attack. He will set up camp in the presence of the enemy, but he will know exactly how to protect you. And so it is absolutely imperative. What is imperative here? That you stay in fellowship with Jesus. We wonder why we get in such a mess in life, don't we? How did we get to this point? How did this happen? And why do I find myself in these circumstances? And, And oftentimes it's so difficult for me as a pastor to even articulate this because when people present this, they're already in such an emotional mess that it's very difficult to point out the spiritual tragedy, which is you have strayed away from Jesus and you've let the enemy ambush you. If you would have walked... With Jesus, the enemy wouldn't be absent, but he wouldn't have, he wouldn't have, he wouldn't have ambushed you. He couldn't. Because Jesus goes ahead of us and intentionally prepares times where, where we get to relax and enjoy his personal attention and abundant provision. He goes ahead of us to prepare those times. Don't think that Jesus is going, to be, is going to clear the slate of your life so that your enemy's not present, so that no pain or difficulty exists. He's just not going to do that. He said, in this world, you're going to have trouble. Where do we live? We still live in this world. You're going to leave here, and you're going to go into the world. You're going to have relationships and circumstances and responsibilities, and all of those things are in this world it's still here and guess what is pervasive in this world the enemy and by enemy i do want you to hear me clearly enemy does not mean the person who's on the other side of the political coin in you enemy is not the person who doesn't believe like you do enemy is not somebody who holds a different value set than you do the enemy of your soul peter identified as the as a roaring lion and he is satan himself and he is the enemy that uses many, many tactics and efforts to destroy the peace and the joy of God's people. But I want you to know Jesus will never, he'll never be taken by surprise by the enemy or ill-prepared for your defense. Never. 
He's just never going to be caught off guard. But I want to urge you to do something today that is very basic. But it's throughout this psalm. It's not stated explicitly. But it is so inherent in the journey of this incredible song of scriptural, uh, rich uh, scriptural substance that we have to speak to it. As faithful as Jesus is, and that is perfectly faithful, unfailing in his faithfulness to us, it is our responsibility to stay near him. In the, in the analogy of sheep and shepherd, that responsibility is inherent in this analogy. The sheep's one single job is to stay with the shepherd. Don't be the errant sheep. Don't be the stubborn, foolish one that leaves the flock, that leaves the shepherd, that thinks they know better, that somehow figures that, and I've seen the shepherd do it long enough, now I can venture out and do it on my own. The sheep that strays from the shepherd is defenseless and will fall victim to the enemy every single time. And if you think today that you can do life on your own, that you're good enough now, that you've got enough spiritual strength and stamina about you, that you know enough about the Bible that you can just kind of venture on your own and wing it and respond to circumstances as they happen, you will find yourself as hapless as a sheep that has wandered into the bush with with a wolf or a lion or a bear or a cougar waiting to ambush. You will find yourself utterly defenseless apart from your shepherd. There's nothing you can do. There's, There's not anything... I have read several articles lately and seen it in a couple of my magazines, outdoor magazines, about people who have survived bear attacks, specifically grizzly bears. And one of the things they all relate is how utterly helpless they feel when a thousand pound grizzly descends upon them. How they didn't realize how big it was until it was on them. And how they feel like a rag in its paws the ferocity and the immense and the indescribable strength of that wild animal is almost indescribable to those who have been victim to it and while I would never herald the strength of our adversary the devil I would tell you you are every bit as helpless in his in his playground as a person is physically against a grizzly bear you got nothing so the scripture says your enemy the devil prowls around like a roaring lion waiting for someone to devour who's he going to devour the one that strays the sheep that gets a little bit outside the flock the sheep that thinks that the shepherd's voice is not that crucial the sheep that thinks that they've got it figured out. Church, I, I'm urging you today with an authentic sense of urgency today. I, I feel particularly compelled of God's Spirit to tell you to walk with Jesus. Not perform for the church or church members or, or to be a spiritual person. I'm saying walk with Jesus, in your brokenness, in your doubt, in your humanity. Walk with Jesus. Walk with Him. And you say, well, Pastor, I know you say that, but how do I walk with Jesus? I can't see Him. I mean, come on, if we're going to be real, let's pull back the curtains. I can't hear Him. I can't touch His hand. How in the world do I walk with this one you keep saying to walk? And I'm going to tell you the same thing I've been telling you, and is that you have to have His rod and His staff as a present guide in your life. And you say, the rod and the staff, what is that? We talked about it last week that is the word of God and the Holy Spirit I'm going to tell you those two things massive essential elements that's how he leads us but let me let me remind you of a couple things before I close first one is As you let his word and his spirit guide you, protect you, correct you, discipline you, and teach you so that you'll be constantly at his side, remember that you're not doing that stuff to perform and impress him. You're doing, you're letting the word of God saturate your life and mind so that you can follow follow the shepherd. 
And I want to remind you of one other thing, that even when you do, because we all have to figure this out the hard way. Every parent knows this, that children learn best the hard way. They learn by trial and error better than they do wisdom. <laughs> I was that way too. Even when we stray, even when we blow it, if we cry out for our shepherd, if we wake up and look around and find ourselves in enemy territory, nowhere near the shepherd, if we cry out to our shepherd, he will seek us out. He will return and rescue us. He is the unfailing shepherd of your soul. I need you to know that because there are no doubt people today that are saying, uh, I'm not real close to the shepherd. I'm not walking with him. What do I do? I want to tell you that if you'll cry out to Jesus, if you'll just say, Shepherd, hear me, I want to promise you that he is unfailing in his pursuit of you, and he will be there. And he will lead you back to the flock. And as a shepherd would do physically with sheep, he may whisper he may even speak sternly words of love and concern. Don't do that again, please. Please stay with me. Please don't risk that ever again. I love you. I want you to be with me. I want you to trust me. I want you to let me take care of you. So let me tell you four things that I believe are essential parts of staying close to Jesus through the word of God and prayer. Those are the staff. That's the rod and the staff. The Word of God and, and, and the Spirit of God and, and, and prayer is certainly wrapped up. It's hardly another step. It is a part of how we incorporate all that stuff into our lives. But here are four things. If you want to say, how do I stay in fellowship with a shepherd? How do I let the Word of God? How am I going to let the Word of God lead me? How am I going to stay in tune with the Holy Spirit? What do I need to do? That is what, the, listen church, and this is not a plug for our process of discipleship is not a plug for that but the reason that I'm gonna say it is because we've designed what we do at this church to answer that question so if someone were to say how do I stay in step with Jesus I would respond to them by this I would say to them I wanna ask you to worship regularly with the church with God's family stay in fellowship with God's people in a worship service there's something powerful about that and I want to ask you to do a second thing. Study the Bible with your spiritual family. Study God's Word. Get to know it. Familiarize yourself with it. Understand it in the context of your spiritual family. You'll never learn better than when you're with the church, edifying yourself in the Word of God, teaching, being taught, and edifying one another with the presence of the Holy Spirit. That is a rich, rich, and essential process. If you think that you can walk out and say, I don't need Bible study, then you're fooling yourself. I promise you are. Thirdly, build close relationships with a small group and do life together with them. We call it life group. Do you know why we do life group? It's not so that I don't feel guilty for not having a Sunday evening service. Did you know I came here and I used to preach Sunday morning and Sunday evening, two different services? And I got here and I thought, I wasn't in a life group. I thought, what do I do on Sunday night? Y'all are paying me way too much to just preach once on Sunday. I need to be preaching Sunday night. And now I look back and think, golly, how did I preach two different sermons? Two different sermons. I do two same sermons on Sunday morning. How did I do two different sermons on one Sunday? And how did they digest that? And, and, and the answer is, I didn't do it well, and they didn't do it well. So now we do life groups. We take this experience, and we put it in to relationship with other people who are in the same journey, on the same journey. So build close relationship with a small group and do life together is almost without fail that those in this congregation and any congregation that don't do that will not stay. You will not stick. If you think that you're here for the show on Sunday morning, you think you'll be around a year from now, I highly doubt it. I highly doubt it. Relationships are so, so crucial to staying on the journey. And the fourth one is get in a one-on-one -on -one mentoring and discipling relationship. If you are not... If you're not discipling someone or being discipled, then you're in a tragic, tragic place because this is not just about you. This is about growing and multiplying. 
Maybe you need to be discipled. Maybe you need a mentor in your life, a spiritual father or mother who can lead you down paths that you've not been down and walk with you as you walk with Jesus. Maybe you need an older sheep in your world, a spiritually older sheep, and somebody that can, can, can edify you, somebody that can know you, somebody that can admonish you, somebody that can help you stay in relationship with Jesus through accountability and love and authenticity. You need that. And I'm going to tell you those four things I think are crucial. You may get along with three out of four for a while, but I promise you they'll catch up. I don't think there's anything in there that's not necessary. Worship, Bible study, fellowship, and mentoring or discipleship in a one-on-one -on -one level, I think they're crucial to stay with the shepherd. And if you stay with the shepherd, guess what? Doesn't matter what tomorrow holds. Doesn't matter what adversity comes. Because you're going to get this experience that is absolutely amazing of experiencing fellowship with Jesus. Peaceful, rich, dynamic fellowship and connection in the presence of adversity. Your enemy who is always, is always going to be lurking nearby. I know there's a great degree of pain and difficulty in a congregation. Always is. I'm going to admonish you to walk closely with the shepherd. Would you pray with me? Shepherd, we stray, and you know that full well. We get harebrained ideas that we can do life without you and without each other, and you know that full well. We are stubborn and obstinate people. We are proud we're self-sufficient and nearsighted. We're fragile and defenseless apart from you. And somehow in all of that reality, we get the notion that we can do life on our own. And Father, maybe there's people who just feel like they've strayed so much that they could never come back. Remind them that you always welcome your sheep back to the flock. Remind them that you love them no matter what. And you always have. Teach us today to stay near so that even in the presence of our enemies and, and adversity we can have calm and joy and rich fellowship with you Jesus I believe personally that my greatest times of fellowship with you are when the enemy is the nearest I don't choose that you know that but that has been the reality and I want to thank you for it in Jesus name Amen. Church, thank you for gathering to worship today. I want to give you an opportunity to respond. And so quickly we go through this. Not quickly because we're in a hurry, but we don't, don't deliberate here. If God has put something on your heart and you just know you're supposed to respond in a certain way, to do a certain thing, whether you come down front and pray is really incidental. I mean, I think it is significant at times. It can be significant for you, but it also can be an impediment to think that you have to do that to make a spiritual decision. One of the, one of the things that you just need to get right now in a response time is to respond. However, whatever facilitates that for you, just say yes back to God today. Just say yes and surrender. If you've heard the voice of your shepherd say you're way outside the flock, then come back. If you've heard the wisdom of your shepherd say, you need one of those four things, you've got three, you've got two, or you're not, in, you know, you're not doing any of them, get involved and, and pay attention to that and, and be a part of the flock. It's important. We're not a church who's asking you to jump through hoops to make the pastor or the staff feel better. We're not presenting programs to just pump up numbers. We're not that church. You know that. We're not asking you to do anything just to get it done. We're asking you to live in a growing relationship with Jesus and everything we do is targeting that. So be a part of that. If you've never declared openly your faith in Jesus, this would be an amazing time to stand up and walk down in front of God's people, His church, His family, the body of Christ and say, I am following Jesus today. If you need questions answered or you want to have a conversation about that, please let us know. And whatever medium you want to do that, you can do it on the worship tear-off. You can do it through an email, a phone call. You can grab us after the worship service. But we would love to have a conversation, not an argument, not a debate, but just to listen to you and respond to you if you need to know the shepherd of your soul. 
Let's stand and respond through song, okay? want to get to that point where you can say you can have this world you can have it i just want jesus let's be that church thank you congregation you can be seated that in mind we're going to ask you to respond boy this is a this is a can be a tricky transition we're not asking you to pay we're not asking you to donate We're not asking you to financially contribute or prop up. We're asking you to respond. Not just to what's going on this morning, but to the vision and the mission of the church in this world. And the more we get that that the church is why we're still here, the bride is moving forward to push back darkness, that, that we're a part of that mission, the more we get that we're here to make disciples, no matter what our vocation is, or a phase of life, the more we get that, the more we surrender our lives. And one of the most magnificent surrenders is, is when we surrender financially. Because Jesus, what did he do? Constantly pushed against our love for money and asked us to surrender it. So we ask, because of surrender, because of the significance of the mission, to give greatly today. Not casually or conveniently. We give with generosity that would honor the king and that would advance the kingdom that he's called us to. Richard, would you pray for the offering? Father, thank you for the rain. A reminder of your care for your creation. Father, let's... creation, let us think of the salvation of your son, 
the beauty is it's bringing into our souls. Let us be a part of spreading that in this community through our hearts. Amen. This one brings me to my knees. There's a table you prepare. And all my enemies are there. Where my shepherd leans, where else can I go? Who else fills my cup till it overflows? There's only one who never fails. Back in the morning light, there's only To the solid rock I fly Though he bids me come and die There's only one, only one Only one who never fails Back in the morning light There's only one Who sits with the gales Ties the trees down tight when all around my soul gives way He is all my hope and stay There's only one, only one, only one I don't know where you found that song, but I'm glad you did. Beautiful. Hey, uh, I hope I can find the, There we go. Youth parent meeting today immediately after the second service. So uh, please, 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 pretty please be here if you're the parent of a teenager in our youth Department Life Fest, a ministry to an outreach ministry to seniors, not just exclusively to them, but kind of built around that. Thursdays, May this Thursday, May second at ten o'clock, right here. Would love for you to be here. Family nights are going to happen again this year. Wednesdays during June and July, family nights are a phenomenal way to connect with people, especially as we go to two services, have had two services, to meet people that go to the other service and hang out with them. It's a great way to invite neighbors to be a part of God's family in a very casual, very fun way. So you'll get more information Wednesday nights all through the summer. They are a great time. God bless you. Please, please engage our Bible study time. Be around for that. You are dismissed. Thank you for being here.